Do we have the roll call, please, Doug? Yes. Yes. Present. Here. Here. Thank you. We are going to skip item number two as our Supervisor is running a few minutes behind, and we're going to go to item number three, approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Item number four, commissioner meetings for compensation. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Alvarado, second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Item number five, Commission Executive Director Branson. Thank you. Um, commissioners, I have a, a few things I'd like to report. Uh, first, I would like to uh, let you all know, make sure you know that Assembly Member Frazier was reappointed by the Speaker of the Assembly as a member of the California Transportation Commission. And just um, from a staff perspective, just want to thank you for your dedication and the amount of interest and, and support that you provide uh, to this commission and to the staff. So, And um, also would like to welcome Secretary Annis and Director Berman to their new appointments. Congratulate them on those and, and welcome you both. <laughs> and commissioners, I uh, want to make you aware that uh, we recently added two additional new members to our staff. We have um, appointed Anya Allenbacher to a position that is assisting uh, Lori Waters in working on the active transportation program. This is going to um, provide tremendous relief to Lori, who has been working extremely, extremely hard on that program, and she does need support. And we know that Anya will also be supporting the other staff as well. She comes from the Sacramento, Sacramento Metropolitan Arts Commission, where she served since 2005 as the Grants and Cultural Programs Coordinator where she oversaw all the Arts, com Arts Commission's grant programs, the Sacramento Poet Laureate Program, the hol Holiday Music Series, and several temporary programs. Um, she also has, prior to that, she spent a brief time working on a production crew for local news broadcasts. So we're pleased to have her join our, our team. We've also appointed Alyssa Securia smith Alicia joined Caltrans in 2007 as a public information officer for Sonoma County, Caltrans District 4. She has later, she has uh, also served District 10 as a small business liaison and then the statewide small business outreach um, specialist for the Office of Business and Economic Opportunities. She um, will be taking over the local streets and roads program and also providing assistance to Teresa on the step. So we're pleased to have her join us. She's, both of these individuals are not here today. So you'll meet them at a, at a future meeting in Sacramento. Commissioners, I have an action item to request your approval to update the 2018 meeting calendar for, um, to reflect the May 23rd legislative briefing that will hold in Sacramento, a tri-state commission meeting with Oregon and Washington Transportation Commissions to be held on August 14th and 15th. Uh, that meeting will be held in the Bay Area with a focus on technology and also to add a joint meeting with the Air Resources Board on December 4th in Southern California. And with that, Commissioners, I'd seek your approval. Second. We have a motion by um, Commissioner von Kornenberg. Um, oh my God, I got to turn mics on and your system okay we're good sorry about that we have a little hiccup there <laughs> we have a motion by commissioner von Koenenberg and a second by commissioner was it done sure. okay you didn't do it but 
Tataloni did? Okay, who did? Someone over there. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. Commissioner Gardino? I, I just had a quick question to Susan. The start and end time on May 23rd for that legislative breakfast? Uh, the uh, briefing will begin at 8.30 and end at 10. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining for the record? Motion carries. Okay. Oh, wait, I have a couple. Oh, you have more? Yeah, okay. I, do. I have a few more. I <laughs> uh, wanted to just remind everyone that we are, the commission is, is participating in a town hall meeting in Santa Rosa on April 11th and 12th. Also, to make the commission aware that um, Chair Inman and myself attended the Ashton Washington briefing in Washington, D.C., and it was an excellent conference, and um, if any of you want any information on that, to let us know. But we really did uh, use that as an opportunity to um, raise concerns with our congressional leaders to ensure that California receives credit for revenues it has raised as, um, as uh, funding proposals are contemplated. We also talked about the freight program in California and the need to stabilize the state highway uh, or the National Highway Trust Fund. Um, also wanted to make you aware that the Department of Finance is, has um, uh, launched a review of the Commission's mission, structure, and operational procedures. So, Commissioners, I will keep you abreast as that uh, undertaking progresses and let you know of, of any issues that are raised by the Department of Finance. And lastly, just um, today before you, uh, Robert will be talking about what's happening overall with Senate Bill 1 implementation, but just want to um, just take this opportunity once again to thank and recognize our staff for all the work that they're doing, all of the partners that are in this room and watching via webcast, um, and the commission, and to make sure that you're aware, and we've let you know, but a true honor uh, that the California Transportation Foundation is recognizing the California Transportation Commission as an organization of the year, and this is a true testament not only on the commissioners and the staff, but all of our partners. So this is a true honor and just want to um, let you all know that. So with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Susan. Um, now we'd like to go back to item number two. I see we have Chair Bartlett. So welcome to the region. Good afternoon, Chair Inman and CTC Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I'm Orange County Supervisor Lisa Bartlett for the 5th District and also Chair One this year for the Orange County Transportation Authority. So let's see if we can get this slide moving. There we go. So Orange County, just a little bit of uh, history about Orange County. We're located just south of Los Angeles, which covers about 798 square miles and includes 34 cities. We have a population of 3.5 million people. Orange County is the third most populous county in the state of California out of the 58 counties, and we are the sixth most populous county in the United States. Um, it's the second most dense county in California behind only San Francisco and also ahead of Los Angeles and uh, Alameda counties. The county seat, which is Santa Ana, is the fifth most dense populated city in the country after New York City, San Francisco, Boston, and Chicago. By the year 2035, the population is expected to grow by 13%, resulting in about 400,000 additional residents right here in our county. It's the equivalent of adding a city the size of Miami or Oakland to the existing population that we have here. No longer just a county of suburban orange groves, Orange County is now a center for the medical, video game, and automobile industries, hosting a thriving business economy and a well-educated workforce. While Orange County parks and beaches provide abundant opportunities for outdoor activities, it is also the home of exciting professional sports, a wide range of tourist attractions, and quality venues for visual and performing arts. In 2016, there were an estimated 48.2 million visitors to the county, and to put that in perspective, during the same year, Los Angeles had 47.3 million and Las Vegas had 42.9 million visitors. 
OCTA is Orange County's primary transportation planning agency. Created in 1991 by consolidating the functions of seven separate agencies. We're governed by a 17-member board of directors, 15 elected officials, including five county supervisors, and 10 city members. That also includes two public members and one governor's ex officio member, which is the Caltrans district director. It is a multimodal focus on transit, freeways, streets, and active transportation. OCTA programs and services include freeways, the 91 and 405 express lanes, motorist services, streets and roads, Orange County Taxi Administration Program, or OCTAP, regulation of taxi cabs, permitting of cab companies, vehicles, and drivers. We have rideshare, rail, OC streetcar, bus transit, and OC Go, which will be discussed in further detail on the next slide and was previously called Measure M. Now that I have oriented you to Orange County, I would like to introduce to you Daryl Johnson, our Chief Executive Officer of the Orange County Transportation Authority. Daryl will take you through the good things that OCTA is doing to develop and deliver transportation solutions and to enhance the quality of life and keep Orange County moving. So without further ado, I introduce you to our CEO, Daryl Johnson. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Bartlett. Um, we were all talking about uh, those of us from the staff here sitting in the audience. This is a different view, but we're very <laughs> happy to have you here today, and we hope that uh, you take advantage of our uh, newly minted boardroom facility for future OCT, or excuse me, future CTC meetings. Uh, we hope you like it and it, and it works uh, uh, for you, but we're happy to have you here. I thought I would pick up where Chairwoman Bartlett left off and talk a little bit about how we fund transportation programs in Orange County, talk about the importance of the different sources, and then give you a sense of what we're working on and how that fits into the overall picture that I know you're very focused on as uh, members of the State Commission. Um, when we look at what we have our funding uh, split is, 68% of our funding is local, and that is through our local sales tax measure. You heard the chair reference uh, Measure M or OC Go with the recent passage of Los Angeles's Measure M. You might imagine there is some confusion, so we want to make sure that our voters understand what Orange County's measure is versus Los Angeles County's measure is and how we differentiate between those two. We do think uh, they did a nice job in stealing our logo, and we're very flattered by that, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, <laughs> the voters in Orange County know what they're paying for. Exactly. Our uh, forecast for Measure M is about $13.5 billion mm -hmm. through 2041. I would note that this went to the voters prior to the Great Recession of 2009, and at that time, the uh, three external parties that do our forecasting forecasted that at about $24 billion. And we've been very focused. Uh, we do none of our internal, uh, none of our forecasting is done internally, it's all, it's all done externally. And we've been very focused in making sure those forecasts are updated every single year. They're open, they're transparent, and we adjust our programs accordingly. But we've lost 44% of that original forecast from uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. And we've scaled and adjusted our programs uh, as appropriate. Uh, as you can see, state and federal funds balance that out with 10% from the federal government and 22% uh, from the state. <coughs> Shifting just a quick moment to uh, SB1, we want to congratulate you and thank you for all of your hard work on Senate Bill 1. Uh, there's two pieces of that hard work that are underway. One was obviously getting it passed. The other one is what you've been doing as commissioners and staff to develop the guidelines. And the third one is where we're gonna come in as regional transportation planning agencies and help you deliver on those promises that, that you made. This gives you a snapshot of what we have submitted, and I won't spend a lot of time on this other than to say that specifically on the freeway improvements, we've been very happy to work very closely with District 12 when Mr. Chamberlain was our district director and with his team to have a comprehensive and partnered approach to the freeway program, specifically on the congested corridors program. Active transportation is something very important to us. What's not on this slide, but I want you to know, is direct uh, service or direct funding to bus operations. Without SB1's passage in last April, we would have asked our board of directors to cut 11% of our bus service, which would have resulted in layoffs of drivers, mechanics, service workers, and others, and also not uh, deliver service to our core. That was a direct infusion, and we say around here that SB1 saved the day as it related to the bus system. And I think as you spend a lot of your time talking about capital projects, it's also important to acknowledge there was another side of that, and we want to thank you uh, for that. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about something that uh, I know you've heard about before, but it's uh, very exciting to us. It's the Interstate 405 Improvement Project. It's currently the largest project ever undertaken within the County of Orange, and it's currently the largest highway uh, project under construction in the state of California. 
And big doesn't always mean best, but I think what's important here is that I like to talk about it as the freeway of the future. And by that I mean it's taking an existing transportation corridor and it's maximizing it to the best of its ability. It has local street improvements in it. Every local interchange has improvements for pedestrians and bicyclists. Every single uh, freeway crossing is being widened or rebuilt to uh, what we call master plan of arterial highway standards. There's 18 bridges that'll be under construction. We're adding general purpose lanes for the general traveling public and we're adding tolled express lanes in the middle of the freeway. The idea here is that this is what our future should look like in the sense of taking a corridor and maximizing how people use it. And we think it's very important. We wanna thank you uh, specifically, Mr. Frazier, for your support of, uh, and uh, sponsoring of AB 194. We couldn't do the project without you and we couldn't do uh, what we're doing without the support of the commission. I also wanted to spend a moment on how this is funded because I think this is how we are likely to fund projects in the future. It's $1.9 billion. And as I said, big is not always better, but 1.1 billion of that comes from our local sales tax. There's about 90 million from the state of California and about 50 million uh, in traditional regular, what I call federal sources. But more importantly is there's a $639 million TIFIA loan in exclusively backed by toll revenues. The interest rate was 2.91% and compared to traditional financing that we would find on the open market, our interest savings alone are in excess of $300 million. With that comes additional pressures to ensure that the project is opened on time. It's being delivered under a design build method uh, that is uh, new for us here uh, in the state, as you know, and we are very focused on making sure this is opened in January of 2023. And as we go forward with this, we would be happy to share with other regional transportation planning agencies, as well as commission staff, lessons learned, not just at the end, but as we work uh, forward uh, through the project. Spend a little bit on bus transit. Bus transit's been in the news quite a bit. Um, uh, declining ridership around the state and uh, virtually every urban area in the United States has seen declining ridership. We found ourselves a bit at the tip of the spear on that three years ago uh, when we started raising bus ridership uh, issues. Uh, our counterparts in other parts of the state uh, were not as concerned. They are now just as concerned. Uh, our board adopted a vision that we call Bus 360, a little bit of play on words, the idea that we're looking at the bus system from all angles. And you, you can see that everything from customer service to marketing and promotion, optimizing service costs and efficiencies. But the whole idea was to make sure that the transit system of the future was accommodating the county of the future and the demographics of the future, not trying to recreate the past. And we've been underway with this. The board adopted the plan in the spring of 2015. We made our first uh, significant number of route changes. We have 77 routes. We changed about 50 of those routes in the fall of 16. And now ridership on the changed routes is up nearly 20%. Our system is still flat overall, but where we've made those investments in, in the core of our county, we've seen ridership up nearly 20%. And we haven't just removed service from unproductive areas. We've also replaced service in certain areas with things like um, other uh, opportunities. Weekend shuttles in San Clemente, for example. San Clemente said, we don't need buses Monday through Wednesday, but we, we sure would love shuttles between Thursday and Sunday uh, during the summer. And we've entered into a partnership with one of the transportation network companies to test out on-demand service in replace of bus routes. Uh, those things are all pilots, and we're learning a lot from those, but we're very happy with the results we see uh, so far. We also see uh, future mobility choices in the core of our county. You heard Chairwoman Bartlett talk about Santa Ana is the secret but fifth most dense uh, city in the United States. And we are uh, later this year plan to begin construction on what we call OC Streetcar. It's a modern streetcar. The process, uh, project cost is about $300 million. It's funded with nearly $30 million of state cap and trade funds, federal formula funds, local sales tax, and federal new starts funds. Just draw your attention very quickly to the uh, simple map. On the right-hand side is the Amtrak Metrolink Los San Corridor, second busiest passenger rail corridor in the nation, carrying about 8.5 million people every year. And on the far left-hand side is Harbor Boulevard. If you don't know Orange County well, Harbor Boulevard is what leads you to the north, to Disneyland and the south towards the airport. That's our busiest bus route, carrying about 15,000 riders a day. And right in the middle where the dark blue is, is the Santa Ana Civic Center, the, which is where the federal courthouse is at, the state courthouse things of that nature. There's about 30,000 total employees in that downtown area. Our goal here is to extend the reach of the commuter rail and Amtrak system to get people from the rail line into the core of the county. We're very excited about this. We will ask our board to 
uh, award vehicles, uh, a vehicle contract on uh, Monday of next week. And we plan to start construction later this year and be open in 2020. And again, very thankful for the support of um, the state as it relates to uh, the cap and trade funds. Shifting uh, to other choices, we've talked about freeways, streets, roads, buses, and trains. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about active transportation. Um, five years ago, OCTA was an observer in active transportation. Today, I'm very proud to say we're a participant and we're a driver in what's happening with active transportation in our county. We're underway with the countywide bike and pedestrian master plan. We've recently, uh, uh, to date, in the last five years, we've made more than $70 million available to active transportation projects, and we've been working with uh, all of our local communities, the Commission, SCAG, and um, Caltrans uh, for a number of demonstrations about what we call OC Active, this idea that it's, it's part of the transportation system, it has a role, and it needs to be there um, as part of the whole system. And if I backed up to the uh, streetcar slide, I could point out there that we're working closely in that streetcar alignment to make sure that all of the stations and the bike paths and bikeways around the station areas accommodate active transportation. They're being planned together. They're not afterthoughts. I did mention earlier on the 405 project, every single interchange also has bicycle and pedestrian treatments to ensure that that street, road, freeway, and bicycle interface are thought of in advance, not thought of at the end. Shifting quickly, um, this is something that we're very, very proud of. Our, our local sales tax measure has a master environmental mitigation program. We set aside funding off the top to look at a comprehensive mitigation for all of our freeway projects. Our sales tax measure has 13 large freeway projects in it. And as you know, the traditional manner in mitigation is to look at uh, parcel by parcel or project by project. Our goal in working with the environmental stakeholders was to have a master mitigation over the last five years, we've acquired 1,300 acres of open space. We funded 350 acres of restoration. And uh, last June, we entered into a master program agreement with the resource agencies uh, to ensure that all of the permitting for all 13 of the measure freeway projects uh, are approved up front. This is something that uh, we can't be more excited about. It's been a, a wonderful uh, partnership with the environmental community and the stakeholders. And at the end of the day, it provides a resource, not only as a biological resource, but also for the taxpayers and residents of Orange County. Part two of that is what we call an environmental cleanup program. Uh, with 42 miles of coastline in Orange County, water quality is something that's very important to us and very important to our taxpayers. We set up within the sales tax program, a competitive funding program for water quality improvement projects. It assists all of our local jurisdictions in complying with the Clean Water Acts. To date, more than $48 million has been awarded to 170 projects uh, throughout the county. Many of these are small projects. They're not capital intensive, but they have significant benefit uh, uh, to, the project, to, to water quality. As you can see, uh, our estimates is that the projects we funded result in over two, 200 million gallons of water conserved and re removal of nearly 6 million cubic feet of trash. This is something that uh, we're proud of, the board is proud of, and we think that uh, is a good model going forward for other, other programs. Uh, coming to the end here, I want to talk a little bit about project delivery. It's great to talk about funding of projects and your ideas, but unless you can build them and get them out there to the public on time and under budget or on budget, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so I just want to uh, point out a couple of key projects we've recently completed on the freeway side. These are in, uh, in partnership with Caltrans. As you can see on the 91, uh, on time and $18.5 million under budget. Uh, $7 million under budget. Our grade crossing and safety enhancement program was about a $100 million program. It came in $4 million under budget. And then a recent parking structure project on time and $2.2 million under, under budget. My, my point here is that we spend a lot of time thinking about the front end of planning and the back end of delivery. And those two things have to come together. And we're very proud of that successful project delivery. And when you make an investment in Orange County, we want you to know that your investment's gonna be managed well and the, what the end result was anticipated will be on the street. Recently, our board of directors adopted a 10-year delivery plan. It covers the end of 2017 through 2026. And there's a lot of detail in the plan, but I think this is what I'd like to leave you with as it relates to that plan, is that adopted plan allocates $1 billion to local street improvements uh, throughout the county, $4.3 billion in freeway improvements, a billion dollars in transit, and another $40 million to ensure ongoing uh, preservation of our open space. 
So when we look at the importance of transportation and mobility, we look at it from all three of these aspects, transit, streets, roads, and highways. We know in a region of 20 million people globally uh, here in Southern California and 3.2 million people in our county, there's not one thing that will fix it all. It's a multitude of things that need to be in our toolbox. And we think this is uh, that balanced plan. We've made some assumptions in here about the future of the STIP. We've made some assumptions in here about the future of SB1. And we made some assumptions in here about local sales tax. But coming together, this uh, represents a nearly $7 billion investment in transportation in Orange County over the next 10 years. I know I talked fast and covered a lot of ground, but I wanted to give you a sense of what's going on in Orange County. Um, so with that, I will close Commissioner Inman and be available for any questions you may have throughout the afternoon. I think red means on. Red means on, okay, only in the OC. <laughs> uh, thank you, Daryl and Chair Bartlett. Honorary Mayor of Orange County, <laughs> Mayor no, Dunn, no, would no, you no, like no, to uh, take that add? One. Thank you. I, I really thank you very much. We, we know you and, and uh, certainly um, his leadership in Orange County is legendary. Um, and thanks for hosting us here. This is a terrific space. Um, because it's unique, one thing that is unique about Orange County is having both OCTA in a sort of a master planning role, delivery role, but we also have the transportation corridor agencies. Could you explain to the commission that unique um, relationship and, and how you're managing that one. Absolutely, Commissioner Dunn. Um, the, the, the Transportation Corridor Agencies, or the TCA for short, has made significant investment in Orange County over the last 20 years. And in fact, a significant amount of our lane miles uh, within the county, uh, the 241, 133, 261, and 73, uh, are because of that. And it has a significant role within, within the county. And we work hand-in-hand uh, -hand, uh, with the TCA on any number of projects. And without them, our system would function less uh, well. And I think without us, their, func their system would function less well. Uh, with that, uh, they continue to work on system expansion, particularly in South Orange County. Um, as the space becomes tighter, we find ourselves uh, planning into some of the same spaces. That sometimes is more challenging than you might imagine. Uh, but I do think that there are positive outcomes there. We're bringing people to the, to the table on that. Um, and then as it relates to uh, the overall sort of um, acceptance of tolling, I think that's really helped us because people understand when they use those facilities, they pay for it and they have a reliable trip. And I think that's helped us as it relates to our success on the 91 express lanes and our uh, what are we anticipate to be our success, uh, success on the 405. So unique, specially funded in a separate way, uh, different governance structures, uh, but planning in the same space is a challenge, whether it's a city in OCTA or the city in Caltrans or OCTA in Caltrans, uh, but we continue to work forward because our, I think our goals are the same as it relates uh, to the end. But it is a unique situation that the other 58 counties do not, or the other 57 counties do not have. I guess I'll hold my microphone on. That will be the solution. Any other uh, comments, questions? I, I just want to say that I think the fact that most of us would not guess that Orange County is the second most dense county in the state of California is a testament to the advanced planning, the continuous planning uh, that has gone in and the collaboration because I think very few, if we had a quiz, uh, across the state would pick out Orange County as the second most dense uh, state. So kudos to you and the supervisor and everybody who's made this work. So thank you, Daryl. Thank you again, uh, Commissioner, or Chair Inman and Commissioners. Uh, welcome to Orange County, and uh, we're happy to be your host, and hopefully you'll come back. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to item number six, and I'm going to start that by recognizing our former chair, former chair Alvarado. So we have a little something for you. Thank you very much. You could say we drove him to drinking, but we'll hope that that just uh, is something you you, you can enjoy. And I want to continue the Hawaiian shirt tradition, but my muumuu just didn't look great today. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anybody else have something to add? How about commissioner reports? No commissioner reports? Okay, then we will move on. Oh, okay. okay, one quick report. So we're all, um, we, we had some very good news that Commissioner Arp, our colleague, uh, was in for surgery this uh, past week, has successfully come out. He should be back to us in May, we believe. And I don't know, Susan, if you have any updates, but uh, he's already cracking jokes, so that's a good sign that, um, and we miss him very, very much, our vice chair. And uh, commissioners, if I could just add, I just uh, received a text from Commissioner Arp. He will be released here shortly, and oh, so good. he's doing doing well. So, and I so misses us all as we miss him. Is he coming today then? No, he won't be here today. <laughs> a return to work. Well, that's great. That's great news. So, okay, item number seven: Secretary of Transportation Brian Annis. Great. Well, Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, wanted to start with all the changes that have occurred in personnel since your last meeting um, and really thank uh, the governor and the governor's appointments office for moving so quickly to keep uh, transportation talent in place and, and promote uh, talented folks to uh, serve at this critical time where we're implementing SB1. Uh, first, uh, certainly wanted to uh, congratulate uh, uh, Commissioner Alvarado and Inman on the governor's reappointment of, of you two. A very wise decision. Um, also, of course, we, uh, uh, since last meeting, uh, uh, Malcolm Doherty uh, left, left the state. We thank him for his many years of, of quality service and the many things he got done as director of Caltrans. But happy to uh, have the governor appoint uh, Lori Berman as director and Ryan Chamberlain, who many of you know well, from Orange County as the Chief Deputy Director. I think, yes. <laughs> I think they're the, the two people that are uh, excellent for this point in time because they're both uh, challenged at the, have been challenged at the district level to work through the many uh, uh, problems you have when you're delivering major transportation projects, working with local officials, uh, working through environmental permits, uh, and they both really excelled at some of these, these challenging pro projects, so we're very happy to have both of them on board. Uh, at uh, the Transportation Agency, uh, we, uh, we're very happy that uh, Christine Inouye is our new undersecretary. And uh, Christine, for those of you that don't know, is a engineer. And uh, she worked many years at Caltrans. But we have started, uh, started borrowing her about four years ago on some very challenging projects, including uh, selling the properties on the 710 corridor in Pasadena. And that's been a very complex project. But she's moving that along. And, and for the commis commission's uh, information on that project, there's four homes. Uh, in escrow for sale to affordable buyers. So uh, perhaps by the next uh, CTC meeting or in June, you should see some of those properties coming forward for approval. Um, also, uh, we have filled a deputy secretary position with Marlon Flournoy, who is also from Caltrans. He's uh, had many roles over the years, most recently chief deputy director, a district director in uh, District 3 for planning. And he's had other roles at headquarters over time, so very happy to have his, his expertise on board. And uh, lastly, uh, we stole another, I guess there's a theme here. We stole another Caltrans employee, uh, Melanie Perrin, who was uh, Caltrans's legislative uh, deputy director, is now the uh, deputy secretary for uh, legislation at the agency. So we're happy to uh, very quickly uh, fill these vacant positions at a, at a critical time. A um, couple other uh, uh, departments just wanted to, to touch on. Uh, of course, Secretary Kelly now is uh, CEO over at the High Speed Rail Authority, and that uh, draft business plan was uh, released a couple weeks ago. As is, is the custom, uh, there's a, a long public review period. I know Chair Fraser, you have a hearing coming up. And as, as usual, they'll, uh, yes, take that, uh, take that uh, public comment to heart and, uh, and uh, a final plan will be uh, coming, I believe, uh, June 1st. 
Uh, also, uh, you're hearing today from uh, the DMV director, uh, Jean Shiamoto, and I don't often have a chance to publicly compliment her work, so I wanted to do that here. Uh, DMV's really done amazing stuff under her leadership, of course. Uh, from a customer perspective, uh, there's a lot of new options, whether it's uh, uh, paying at a self-service kiosk at a local supermarket for uh, paying your vehicle registration to uh, uh, other uh, improvements in the uh, appointment system and online payment options that have expanded to, to help customers. Uh, also, there's some very big uh, initiatives that have been implemented there. And as, a, as almost as a public service, wanted to mention one of them, and that's uh, DMV in January started offering uh, uh, card holders, both the driver license and the ID card holders, the option to obtain a federally compliant ID card, which the federal government instituted new rules. They're going to start enforcing those new rules in October 2020. You'll need a different uh, card to board an airplane, get through the TSA screening. Uh, you can use your passport, but if you choose to, you can also get a uh, what's called a real ID compliant driver license. And to get that when you renew, you'll go into the DMV office and again, re-verify your, your identity with birth certificates and other documents. But uh, that's something everyone should, should plan for because if you don't choose to use your passport for flying aircraft, then that's something by October 2020 you'll want to <laughs> pay some attention to so you can get on a plane. Uh, DMV is also uh, next month implementing uh, the voter motor voter law, which will make uh, registering to vote at the DMV an opt out instead of an opt in process. So the customer won't have to fill out a separate form; they'll just be able to uh, uh, enter their their uh, information as they're getting their license, and then they'll get a, an option whether they'd uh, want to opt out of voting. And if, if they don't opt out, then they're they're uh, and they're eligible, then they'll be able to uh, to be registered to vote. Um, Gene's also going to talk to you, of course, about autonomous vehicles and, and those regulations. And uh, we've been operating for a couple years now on a certain uh, a testing regulations for vehicles that have a, a backup driver. Uh, the new regulations have uh, provisions where you could have a driverless vehicle also uh, be uh, uh, be tested on public roads. Uh, the safety import of this area, of course, was highlighted just recently in Arizona where there was a fatal crash. And uh, uh, DMV uh, in California, by having a robust regulatory scheme, does, uh, I think, put the state in a good position both to uh, approve uh, 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 testing uh, by manufacturers, but also have the ability to uh, pull a uh, uh, registration or a permit where, where needed for, for safety. Um, I'll just end on our favorite topic of SB1. I know the Commission has some uh, big actions at this meeting regarding uh, the STIP and the shop that are SB1 funded. So I wanted to let the Commission know that uh, uh, Caltrans is doing a great job moving forward to get the transit formula money out. On uh, uh, March 16th, uh, they sent the list to the controller of eligible entities to receive uh, the transit formula money. And uh, uh, this is part of it that comes from the vehicle fee that's uh, a state of good repair uh, program for transit vehicles. And uh, with that list, the controller would be able to start allocating uh, funds that have, are coming in during this first quarter, uh, January through March. And I think by mid-May, uh, those checks will go out to transit agencies to do a bunch of great projects. And soon the uh, Rebuilding California website will have that information as well so people know what the transit funding is from SB1 in their areas. Here's what I found on the web for California. So that's, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, was that Siri who wanted to talk next? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. We're going to move on now to item number eight, Director Berman. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here in my new position. I've interacted with several of you, but I'll just take a minute to tell you about myself. I've been with Caltrans for 34 years. I've worked in a lot of different parts of the department. Most of you know me from the last eight years that I've been the District 11 Director down in San Diego. Um, I'm very passionate about developing strong partnerships, and I'm, I'm just incredibly honored to have been appointed as director. It's really an exciting time to be working in transportation, and it's particularly exciting to be a leader at Caltrans right now. 
Um, the department is heading in the right direction, so you're not going to hear me talk about we're going to go off in a different way. We're, we're heading in the right direction. We have a lot of work to do, and I'm just really excited to be able to work with a very strong team to get it done. Now, I feel like I should tell you to take out your scorecards because we have a lot of changes. Um, so as you heard, Ryan Chamberlain, who was most recently District 12 Director, is now our Chief Deputy Director. Ryan was the district. <laughs> no, it's good. People think that Southern California is going to really influence. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Ryan was the District 12 Director for nearly six years. And uh, since both he and I have left our districts, I'm moving a few people around until we have an opportunity to make permanent replacements. So Tim Gubbins, who many of you know, he's, his day job is the District 5 Director. He started in District 11 this week as the Acting District 11 Director. Tim has 30 years of experience with Caltrans, the last six as the District Director. Richard Rosales, is Richard here? There's Richard. Richard is now the Acting District 5 Director. And he has been, his most recent job is the uh, Deputy District Director for Program Project Management. And he brings also about 30 years of experience to Caltrans. I saw Adnan out there. Adnan. Adnan Maya is the Acting District 12 Director. Adnan joined Caltrans in 1992 and has held a number of positions um, since that time. Cur most recently, he has been the Deputy District Director for the Capital Outlay Program. You still with me? I've got more. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank Tim, Richard, and Adnan for taking these new challenges on. And I also want to thank Corey Bins. Corey was the acting District 11 director while I was the acting chief deputy director in Sacramento. <laughs> okay. I'm also pleased to announce the appointment of Carrie Porvahiti as the acting SB1 program manager. Um, she'll be serving as the department's focal point for coordinating the implementation of SB1. And many of you know Carrie from her current assignment as the program manager for the Road Charge pilot program, where she's been responsible for the development, deployment, and reporting on the results of the largest road charge effort in the nation to date. And I'm very excited about bringing Carrie into the SB1 program. Okay, now for the hard part. Two of our executives have announced their retirements. Um, Norma Ortega, where are you, Norma? She's back there. <laughs> you all know Norma. She's our CFO. She'll be retiring after 37 years with Caltrans, and I, I want to thank her for her dedication and her hard work, her knowledge, her expertise, and she personally has been so helpful to me as, as, a, as a district director and now as the director. So I'm kind of, I'm very disappointed, but I'm happy for Norma. It's, it's a big loss for Caltrans, and she'll be leaving in the middle of April. And I want to also let you know that Norma has won some significant awards over the years. Most recently, she was um, the Sacramento WTS Chapter Woman of the Year. And yesterday, I learned, and now Norma's going to learn, <laughs> that she is being honored as Person of the Year by the California Transportation Foundation at their annual awards banquet. Yay. So I hope that means we'll get a chance to see Norma again in May. Um, where's Bijan? <laughs> Bijan is our, you all know Bijan, he's our District 4 director. He has also announced his retirement at the end of the month. And when he told me the end of the month, I said, which month? It's, it's this month. Um, Bijan has been with Caltrans for 36 years. He's done a great job leading a very large district. And in my opinion, Bijan has been the gold standard for district directors. He is somebody that we all want to be like. He is somebody that I have always appreciated his advice when I've tried, taken on a new challenge in District 11. A lot of times I've, I've asked Bijan how he managed to make things work. Um, he's also been uh, very helpful, with, very engaged with the Small Business Council and really made a big difference there. During Bijan's tenure, the district completed several iconic projects in, in the Bay Area, including opening the New Bay Bridge, Devil's Slide, Caldecott Tunnel. I think that was all done in one year. Um, I don't know how he managed a district that size and still really modeled the way for all his staff. I had a chance to spend a day there last week, and obviously, you know, the staff really appreciate his, his leadership, and he will be sorely missed, and, and I do wish him all the best. Um, and, yes.
And um, I'll let you know that Jim Davis, who you all know, is going to be temporarily going to the, as the acting district four director. Okay, so you got that? Okay. Um, both Norma and Bijan were fixtures at these meetings, and um, I want to also note that the best legacy and contribution made by both of them is that they trained a number of people who are now ready to step into these critical leadership positions. And I look forward to reporting some new additions to the Caltrans executive team at future meetings. I also want to take a moment, as Secretary Annis did, to thank Malcolm Doherty. Malcolm really set the department on a good course and was instrumental in providing the leadership to change our mission and vision, which truly allows Caltrans to be transportation leaders. Okay, so that's the personnel side. Um, I'll give you a quick update on the storm damage. There's nothing new to report, but we are closely monitoring what's happening um, in the coastal areas, particularly in Montecito and Santa Barbara. Um, and we've also been working with Napa and Sonoma counties to stabilize hillsides, remove dead trees, and shoring up drainage on state facilities as a continuing part of the recovery from the fires of October of 2017. Okay, so for this CTC agenda, I'm looking forward to the shop hearing and the adoption of the 2018 shop as well as the STIP. And I want to thank the CTC staff for their efforts and support in working with us to get these programs to this point. I also um, had a discussion with Director Branson and, and she reminded me, well, I, I was asked to remind the commission of what was discussed at our delivery workshop at the last commission meeting, which if you were there, I think it was, it was a really good workshop. Um, but we talked about supplemental funds, and I know there's some on the agenda this month. But keep in mind that um, over the last 15 years, 2.6% of our construction contracts have come to the commission for supplemental funds, and it's been less than half a percent of the total dollars allocated. So I know it's painful when we come for those, but we don't come that often. I also have some other really good news. On March 15th, California became the first state Department of Transportation in the nation to receive federal highway certification of, of our Transportation Asset Management Plan, or the TAMP. This is a huge accomplishment, and I know Mike Johnson's out there. Stand up. There you go. Mike Johnson and his team um, did an amazing job over the last several years, and I really applaud them for the work that they did. And I want to also thank the CTC and the Commission staff for their efforts in working with the Department on the Transportation Asset Management Plan, and that will be on the agenda later. Finally, in closing, I want to just mention a person that I don't think any of you know about, but earlier this month, Caltrans District 7 District Materials Engineer Kirsten Stahl passed away. And I mention this for a couple of reasons. Kirsten was passionate about pavement design. And it's because of people like Kirsten that when we build SB1 projects, our pavement's going to last a lot longer. And this doesn't just happen. It's people who are dedicated to their particular field who are pushing us forward. And um, today we talk about pavement life that exceeds 40 years. I think when Kirsten first got started, we were talking about could we get pavement to a 20-year life? Um, it's also interesting to note that we learned of her death on the same on Women's History or International Women's Day, and it was the same day that the LA Times ran an article about her late mother, uh, Marilyn Jorgensen Reese, who was a senior transportation engineer in District Seven, and she was the first, excuse me, the first female registered engineer in the state of California, and she was the senior engineer in charge of the design of the 40510 interchange for which she received the Governor's Design Excellent Award from, Excellence Award from Governor Pat Brown. And the reason I mention this is at these meetings, we go through a lot of projects, a lot of money is allocated, and sometimes it's nice to think of the people who are quietly in their office making all of this happen, and I'm very excited to be leading them. And that concludes my report. Wow, thank you, Lori. Any questions, Commissioner Gamati? There we go. Um, Lori, first off, I just want to congratulate the department on the, on their effort to clean up 101 in Santa Barbara. I mean, that was a Herculean effort. Out of curiosity, what have, what have you, do you know what we've spent to clean up that, that freeway? I don't have that, but I, I can get back to you with that number. Okay, thank you. Well, in keeping with Lori's theme, 
uh, for us to have scorecards. I would say then we have batting ninth today for Federal Highways, Vince Mamano. Clean Thanks. Just, uh, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that welcome. It's beautiful. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate Fran and Brian and Lori and Ryan. Uh, we're glad to have those other ones out of their jobs so that you guys can do it right. So we, we look forward to the coordination and the collaboration that comes with it. I'm talking about you, Alvarado, just so you know. All right. Um, so scorecards out if you want. Um, Butch Weidlich, uh, many of you know Butch Weidlich, he has announced his retirement, so he is our executive director. Um, so he is our highest ranked uh, career person in Federal Highway. He had my position here as division administrator for a few years, and then he moved up to my boss level, and now he's the top career guy for Federal Highway. So he'll be retiring at the end of May. Um, super, I know, I think Fran, you and uh, Susan met with him last week or a couple weeks ago, just a super, super passionate man and made a huge difference for Federal Highway. Um, so we're, we're sad to see him heading off, but, uh, he's actually going to be moving West. I think he's got family in here in California and everything. So, um, I have a new boss also, Peter Osborne. Um, he was actually here for a little while on a rotational assignment with Federal Rail Administration, uh, working with the High Speed Rail Authority here in California. So many of you may know him. He is my boss. He's sitting in uh, Colorado. I would give you his number, but you're not allowed to call him. Um, falls under the tough noogies category if you want to you know, go over my head. Too bad. Uh, so a couple things. So thank you, uh, Lori, for keeping in, uh, in line with everything Malcolm always did and steal the thunder that I was going to talk about. So I appreciate that. You did nice. You're very good. Very impressed by you. Um, so the TAMP, Lori talked about tra tra transportation asset management plan. The one thing she didn't mention uh, is she may have mentioned that it was the first one in the, in the country to, to meet the April 30th deadline. Uh, but the thing that that struck me with that one. We had a discussion, uh, national discussion on this internally, discussing the, the this challenge with this asset management plan that all the states are having right now. Uh, and our lead guy in head in our headquarters was just touting Cal California's TAMP. They, he was just saying this this is the model. This is what everybody should be doing. They went above and beyond. Uh, it is clearly what the other states should be trying to do. So a lot of the other states will be reaching out to California to, to find out how best to do that coordination. Uh, and I know Mike Johnson had a, a lot to do with that, and I really appreciate the effort that went into that. Uh, and I think it's that's coming up for a vote uh, th today or tomorrow. But but uh, so Federal Highway uh, has recognized that plan as being a national example. Uh, so congratulations to you all on that. Um, we received the state the state draft state mobility freight plan, so we'll be hopefully approving that or have it uh, reviewed by the time you have your May meeting. Uh, that that will allow us to use the formula of fast act freight funds when we get that. Say that one time in a row fast, um, and then we have a Tiger Award. So congratulations to the city of Modesto on the 132 Gateway project for their Tiger Award. Uh, the one thing I noticed on that, and I've, I've already heard the, hey, how come we only got $9 million here in California and there was that much? Uh, I don't have an answer to that. I, um, clearly, I can't if I did, but I don't, so I won't. Um, but I think one of the things that struck me in that, and I looked at the, the, the 31 projects that were federal. So when they, they do the TIGER, TIGER is a DOT program, so it's all Department of Transportation, not just Federal Highway. So it's a DOT t program, and then they send out all the projects, and then they Say, all right, your agency, your agency is in charge of this one, your agency is in charge of that one. So of the 31 that Federal Highway is in charge of um, or is responsible for, 23 of those 31 were rural. Um, so it was eight urban and 23 rural. And I think the, the, um, the Modesto one came under the urban area. So uh, I just thought that was an interesting uh, observation that there's uh, quite a bit of rural in the Tiger program. Uh, we have no... no uh, uh, answers or anything like that right now with what's happening with the infra program. Uh, so that's still under review. Uh, we also got a, 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 Caltrans also got a grant under the Resiliency and Durability to Extreme Weather Pilot. So that's a, 
uh, planning uh, grant that we've uh, awarded to California to look at uh, resiliency of our system. Uh, so congratulations there, and hopefully I have a job at the end of this week because we still have a continuing resolution that ends this week, and um, we'll see what happens <laughs> at the end of that one. Uh, I think I hit everything. Oh, oh, nope. We authorized our first SB1 project at a federal highway So this week. So we actually, when I was talking to my staff yesterday, they said, by the time you talk, we'll be having a second one that's already authorized. So there's, uh, we appreciated that the recognizing that the challenges with SB1 that you're dealing with and everything, there's been a lot of federal dollars that are going to be, those projects can be matched with federal dollars or used with federal dollars. Um, and uh, so we, in our office, those are a priority to us to make sure we can help deliver those projects as quickly as possible. And uh, so we've already gotten a couple of those authorized out of our office. So I think that is all I have. Any questions for me? Questions from the commission? Uh, Vince, will you let us know if you run into any gridlock with our SB1 uh, yeah, project queue line? Because right. we're all working very, very diligently right. to get those projects out. So Yeah, there's a great collaboration. Uh, and Caltrans gets that, too. I mean, there's a great collaboration with it. And the systems are... The way our systems are, are lined up, these things can move very quickly and, and correctly, not skipping anything. We've got a pretty efficient system that hopefully that we're catching everything and it's being done correctly. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item Great. number 10, regional agencies. Patricia Chin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Patricia Chen with LA Metro. And I want to add that I believe in bowling, it takes 10 pins to make a strike. Um, OK. The RTPA group would like to thank the CTC staff for their hard work in bringing the STIP program together, um, balancing priorities, capacity, and timing, and taking last minute changes in stride. We really appreciate all the effort and the whole group uh, expressed support for the staff recommendation. Uh, we also talked about the possibility of working together um, in a coordinated effort to develop region-specific information materials that can be used uh, by regions around the state uh, to make sure the benefits of SB1 are known to all that uh, are involved in the process. Um, and uh, CalCog staff chimed in from the phone and said that they have lots of tools available uh, to help. So um, we look forward to meeting and working together and seeing how we can enhance those efforts. Additionally, we are planning a workshop. Uh, this is jointly um, an effort by Caltrans and the RTPA group um, to prepare for delivery, since uh, hopefully there will be a lot of awards in May. And so there will be all the usual allocation requests that have always been coming in, plus a big new bunch. And so um, it'll really be um, our chance to prepare and refresh and make sure we all know how to efficiently and effectively deliver those projects. Um, and it's exciting for some of us that have done a lot of work with federal funds, um, have the opportunity possibly of working with large state-only funded projects, kind of like an animal that didn't exist before. So that's one more thing that we need to learn about and make sure we know how to follow the um, regs uh, very efficiently. Um, those are my remarks for today, and thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Do we have any questions? Okay, we're going to move on to the rural counties, Mora. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Mara Toomey, Chair of the Rural Counties Task Force. The Rural Counties met on March 9th and discussed the following issues and concerns. In regard to SB1 accountability guidelines, the Rural Counties appreciate the Commission's consideration of their concerns regarding efficiency and flexibility and appreciate the efforts of Commission staff to develop guidelines in an open and transparent manner. The Rural Counties support the staff recommendation to adopt the SB1 accountability guidelines. In regards to the step, the rural counties want to thank commission staff for all their hard work in developing a balanced program and support the staff recommendation to adopt the step as proposed. The rural counties would also like to congratulate Secretary Annis, Director Berman, and Chief Deputy 
Director Chamberlain on their appointments and look forward to working with them. And finally, the rural counties would like to congratulate Norma Ortega and B. John Sertipi on their retirement and want to thank them for all their service and their efforts on our behalf. That concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. We have any questions? Thank you, Maura. Okay, we'll move on to item number 12, the South Health. That would be Keith. Thank you, uh, members of the committee and chairman. We also would like to congratulate uh, everyone on their new positions. I won't go through and name everyone, but we're looking forward to working with folks. I had a whole routine worked around the number 13 that I worked up with uh, Ray Wolf on numerology that to fit into the, the, the theme here, but we're only number 12. So what I'll say is if you double it, there's 24 uh, self-help county members. Is it a coincidence? I don't know, I'm just saying so. Um, yes, uh, we're very pleased to look at this year and look at implementing SB1 uh, and working with the commission and Caltrans to make sure that we're building in as many efficiencies as possible. We think that there's some uh, good work that's been done and we've got some other ideas to make sure that we're hitting uh, the most efficient delivery we, as we can so the citizens of California not only get the benefits of that investment, but also see it at a first-hand basis on a real-time basis, and then we can go out and talk about it. So we're looking forward to working with the commission and the department to build off of the efficiencies that are already there and try and find ways that we can partner together to deliver these projects not only in a timely fashion, but also in the most efficient ways possible. Since our last meeting, the Self-Help Counties has had a meeting and a few conference calls to address some of the issues as we see coming down through the legislature. Uh, we look forward to working and continuing to work with Chairman Frazier and his committee to shape policy here in California. We have a couple little ideas that we're going to be working on um, with him um, and uh, Chairman Bell as well. But really just pleased to be here, looking forward to a successful year and working together in partnership with all of you to build California. And uh, that will take any questions if you have any. Thank you. We have any questions? Thank you, Keith. Yep. Moving on, item number 13, Innovations in Transportation. Garth? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, commissioners, tab 14 is an informational item. And, uh, excuse me, tab 13 is an informational item. Uh, Ron Milam is a principal in charge of technical development with the consulting firm Fair and Peers and is going to be discussing emerging trends and disruptive transportation. Thanks, Garth. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, Commissioners. Um, this particular topic is related to a lot of different um, changes in transportation that we're all facing, whether you're working in the public agencies or the private sector. And it's based on some research that we've done over the last couple of years. I don't have time to go through all of the disruptive trends. We've identified at least 16 so far that are very important to our ability to forecast the future and what's likely to happen when you make investment decisions uh, in our transportation network. I will share some of the research specific to autonomous vehicles and transportation network companies, or TNCs, such as Uber and Lyft. Give you a little bit of context for these trend variables. Um, in putting together our research, we actually looked back in time before we looked forward in time. And what the research showed is that if you go all the way back to 1970, a lot of our vehicle travel was associated with the population and employment growth that was happening, which generated a lot of economic activity. So VMT growth and GDP were highly correlated, and a lot of the trend variables that we looked at were also correlated moving in the same direction. But then we hit 2004, and we saw something different. We basically saw a decoupling of VMT growth from economic activity. And we actually started to see our first declines, uh, and that went all the way through the recession to about 2012, where we started to see the trend move back upwards. And you can see the trend variables at the top here. A number of them also changed direction. In 2004 is when we started to see the early effects of the internet, whether it was internet shopping, telecommuting, social networking, things that could replace our, our normal uh, reasons for travel. And as we look forward, one of the challenges that we see is the fact that these disruptive trends really present potential risk um, or threats to a lot of the investment decisions that we are um, currently making or planning. And in fact, our forecasts show that we could see a very large range um, as low as 8,000 VMT per capita in the future to a high of 18,000 VMT per capita. That's the amount of average travel that someone uh, drives nationally. Uh, here in California, we're, we're in, in a similar uh, condition. And so we wanted to see if we could narrow this range. For us transportation planners, it's very difficult to forecast the future when we have ranges this big, especially if you're asking us uh, questions about fixed network investments. So we've looked a lot high and low, and what we found is that there is a bit of a tipping point in the research. Uh, the TRB annual meeting in, G in January this year, I uh, had research from people like Tony Seba that looked at 
uh, a forecast out to 2030, and that with the continuing decline in electric vehicle technology um, and the advent of autonomous vehicles, we may see 95% of passenger miles by 2030 being delivered uh, by electric autonomous vehicles. And if you think of this from a, a risk or a threat perspective, obviously there's a risk to gas tax revenue. Um, there's also a risk to major in infrastructure investments if a lot of this uh, type of service are pooled rides, where more people are sharing their vehicles. You may not need as much capacity. We also had evidence from the TRB meeting from Bruce Shaler of New York that showed, uh, despite increases in employment that was occurring in most metropolitan areas, declining transit ridership. Transit was becoming less competitive, uh, especially if you take into consideration the fact that more people were able to buy autos during this time or use transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. And so looking specifically at uh, the TNCs, uh, UC Davis did some research that looked at the fact that the passengers that were using those particular modes, 60% of them were brand new vehicle trips, meaning those passengers would have otherwise using, used transit, walk, bike, or maybe not made the trip at all. That's brand new VMT that we didn't account for in our regional modeling or our local modeling or even in our statewide modeling. So as we look to the future, what we've tried to do is anticipate what happens when today's TNCs become tomorrow's autonomous vehicles and delivered in the same fashion. And that modeling looked at nine different regional models from around the U.S. Uh, we also used uh, two freeway simulation models from Caltrans projects we've worked on uh, here in the state to help inform some of that regional modeling. And some of the tests we're doing are pretty straightforward. If you're running around in an autonomous vehicle, you're not having to pay for parking costs, for example. Uh, these vehicles will pick you up door to door, so there's no terminal times. Uh, also, if you're not having to drive, uh, you're basically able to do other things. Your value of time decreases. So we plug those results into the models. Here's what we start to see. Uh, we see VMT increases uh, as much as 70%. Um, even if we presume that 50% of the drive alone trips are going to shift to a carpool type, type ride, uh, we still see increases uh, over 40%. This is a real risk or threat to a lot of our current plans. And if you were to look at this from a transit lens, some of the trends we've seen recently with declining ridership would only get worse. We've seen declines as high as 75% in some of the modeling. Again, this is looking at samples from around the country, different models from different states. But the same pattern emerges wherever we look that if you basically move from a, a model today where people are largely owning and operating their own vehicles to one where they're autonomous, they're very low cost, um, and they're ubiquitous, they take you wherever you want to go, door to door, you're basically making vehicle travel less costly, both in terms of time and money. And so what we wanted to do was see if we could also find any evidence of, are the modeling results we're seeing, are they real? Can we find observed data that would match up with this? Uh, there's at least one, uh, I know it's a very small sample, uh, but this came from UC Berkeley this year where they looked at 13 different subjects in the Bay Area and gave them free chauffeured service. So they basically could go wherever they wanted in a, in a free chauffeured um, vehicle. And what they also found was a 76% increase in VMT um, and virtually no biking or transit use by this, this group. Uh, SACOG is going to repeat this example um, here in the next couple months as part of their household travel survey. They're going to look at something closer to 100 households, so we'll actually get some more data. Um, but what this starts to tell us is that if you make vehicle travel um, lower cost, both in terms of time, time and money, uh, you're likely to get more vehicle travel. There's no real surprises there. But what it does raise in terms of questions is whether you're looking at local governments, regional governments in the state, or Caltrans, um, there's a lot of expectations about the future and the direction of change that's built into a lot of our plans, whether looking through a greenhouse gas lens or active transportation, is that we've been focused on trying to increase non-auto non travel. Um, in the strategic management plan, we have the triple-double-double, -double, tripling bicycle mode split and doubling the pedestrian and transit mode splits, and we have VMT reductions as high as 15% between uh, 2015 and 2020. Uh, if you're looking at the directionality of those changes going, you know, decreases, what we're seeing in a world where you make vehicle travel uh, less costly uh, is the exact opposite reaction. And this is starting to affect our local planning, whether we're doing a general plan uh, or working on major infrastructure investments with, with Caltrans. And what it raises is a fundamental question for all of our public agencies with, with regards to the policy response. Recognize that all the modeling that I just talked about was done in a world where we've presumed that the federal government and the state government have not intervened yet. 
They have not given us a policy of response to say what the cost will be, whether future AVs will have to be electric and be shared. So this is kind of a glimpse of the future in a world where all you're doing is letting the private sector deliver something very similar to TNC service today. And what happens in that potential world is you would probably get a lot more vehicle travel. As we talk to public agencies, though, what they've told us in their plans or as part of the planning processes that we're updating right now is they'd like to see a future where there's more trips being public and shared. That gives us the benefits of reduced congestion. It gives us the benefits of, of less emissions. But right now, the way that the teeter-totter is angled here, um, we're not seeing that direct effect. What we're seeing is the private sector that operates TNC service today that may be the ones operating uh, autonomous vehicle service in the future, you're making their, uh, their basic model less expensive to, uh, to operate. Um, and in that world, you're likely to see more private ownership and more people traveling by themselves. Um, those are all choices that people make within the cost structure of the private companies. And their basic profit model today is to sell us miles, while the public agencies, uh, at least here in California, are working very hard to try and reduce the miles for the reasons I mentioned earlier, such as reducing greenhouse gases and encouraging active transportation. Now, again, this is very early research that uh, we've just recently completed. Um, we are sharing it with public agencies as, as part of forums like this um, to help better inform the policy discussion. With that, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Pong. There seems to be some pretty big um, policy questions that come out of this. Other than, what, have, have you guys started thinking about whether the macro questions that we should be discussing now that we're going to have to, if, if this tipping point is true, what do we need to, what do we need to be deciding now to get ahead of the curve? Yeah, that question is being asked by a lot of agencies. So in places like Utah and Oregon right now, we are doing work where they're looking at what is the policy response list of options? What does our menu look like? And can you test what the effects are? So in Utah, for example, we've done projects where for transit, they want to see, well, how do we make transit more effective? And we tested everything from operating the transit free to running at 24 hours to reducing the headways and providing bus only lanes. And it made the transit much more effective. Uh, in Portland, we're looking at pricing. Um, what happens if you price the future of AVs, um, such as uh, you basically provide the biggest disincentive for those folks that are um, using the car on their own, or if they're using the car without any passengers. So you've just called the, the ride and it's basically operating on the roadway network with no passengers. So pricing is definitely one of the options that have been looked at. So there's a wide variety of policy responses. And the question for you is really, um, how far out in front do you, do you get? Um, right now, if you think of the federal and state governments and, and generally the position that's being taken is they're pretty accommodative of testing the vehicles and, and, and testing the operations. But at what point do they go into revenue service and then does that somehow start to limit your choices? Um, because you'll end up being in a position where they're already operating, the customers have been accustomed to current pricing, and if you start to try and increase the pricing, um, will that be politically feasible? So those are some of the issues that are coming up in the other states where we're actually doing some of that analysis. Can I ask staff that for our August meeting, when we're going to be considering these issues with Oregon and Washington, that we come up with a provocative framework where we, where we kind of lay out the big questions you know, like a month ahead of time so that all of us can bring, um, wrestle with that a ahead of time um, so that that's a real productive time with Oregon and Washington so that I think if we're all, if the three of us are on the same page, that, that will set a trend. I think this is very timely. We're working right now with Oregon and Washington on that agenda. And so we'll move forward in that fashion and just really appreciate Ron being here today. He's someone who I personally have reached out to over the years. And uh, just his partnership with the state leaders is just very much appreciated. So, um, yeah, we'll move forward on that. Any other questions? Uh, I think, I, oh, Commissioner Gometti. Um, thank you, Chairman. You know, I, I look at this and I'm going, are, are we are we going in the wrong direction? Uh, um, you know, we put a lot of money into transit. We're putting a, a lot of money into active <clears throat> active transportation. Um, and I'm I'm all for that. But I'm 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 just curious from your standpoint, or, or you know, when I look at this, what you just presented to us, I'm I'm thinking, you know, we may be going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think the question, um, as I look at the research. 
going back three or four years ago, we had academic researchers looking at this very theoretically, that if you lower the cost of vehicle travel, um, both in terms of the, the money involved and the time spent driving, the research clearly points that you'll get more vehicle travel. But it didn't tell us really exactly how much more vehicle travel might we get and whether or not it would contribute to congestion. Um, and so what we've done is take it to the next step where we've actually plugged these types of effects directly into our travel models. Um, now these models aren't perfectly designed to capture all these effects, um, so consider this very preliminary research. But I think the, the general direction of change and the magnitude of change is probably in the right ballpark. Uh, and so the, the, the question for the, you know, the public sector, if you, if you look at our transportation network, is if we lower the cost of vehicle travel, and by we, I, I should probably be saying the private sector, um, if, if they're going to lower the cost of vehicle travel such that there's going to be an increase in demand, think of all the people that can't drive today, that don't have a driver's license, those under 16, elderly, disabled, they will have access to low-cost vehicle travel. And the rest of us will also have access to low-cost vehicle travel. Um, that usually um, makes it pretty clear that we will get more vehicle travel. And the question is, what do we do from the public angle, from the public perspective? What are the counter strategies? If the private strategy is sell us miles, what's the public strategy for reducing those miles? And it really means sharing. It means sharing the vehicles, pooling the rides, and absent the public sector weighing in, um, I think one of the potential outcomes is that, yeah, you get a lot more vehicle travel, Maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now, the, the vehicles will be smart enough that we don't end up with congestion. But our modeling shows that in the first few years, think 5, 10, 15 years, you could see a lot more vehicles travel very quickly and a lot more congestion even. In fact, the simulation models I mentioned, we're doing research right now to understand if freeway capacity goes up because autonomous vehicles can follow each other much more closely, can we get them off at the off-ramps? Um, the general answer is, not so much. If they're the same size vehicles that we have today, it takes the same amount of green time to get them through the signal at the off-ramp. So we are looking to a future that is potentially very different than it is today. We don't have all the, um, the questions worked out. I still haven't gotten into the drone delivery of freight and passengers. Those are some other uh, disruptive trends. But yeah, there's some clear direction that you can take away from the analysis um, so far. I wish you would study San Francisco. I live there, and, and we have a whole bunch of things. We have transit buses. Um, we, we've got a lot of new bike lanes. We've taken lanes to travel off. I've got Uber and Lyft there, and I've never seen San Francisco, and I've lived there for a long time, as crowded and as congested as it is today. It, it might be something for you guys to take a, just a look at what happened in San Francisco over the last 10 years. We did just work with the city on one of their travel trend surveys that they do every year. Um, one of the things about San Francisco is also just the number of new modes that have been introduced. You have bike share, you have scooters. Um, you know, if you're down here in Southern California over at Santa Monica or San Diego, you'll see the e-scooters. The e um, you know, there's a lot of new travel options that we didn't, you know, project would be, would be here uh, today, and we don't have them built into our models. Um, one of the other risks I also think here, not that this is necessarily a CTC item specifically, but when we talk about a lot of the emissions policies of the state for greenhouse gases and air pollution, um, more vehicle travel, at least if it's powered by, um, by fuels, definitely works against our greenhouse gas and our air pollution goals. And so how do you find that, that right balance of providing all the benefits of the, of the mobility and the safety that come um, with some of these new forms of travel with, with, without some of those negative consequences? That's why that teeter-totter, uh, I use that analogy, is what is that right balance? Right now, the public sector hasn't put their foot on the end of the teeter-totter. Um, so the question is, how far do you have to push to balance it out? Commissioner Gardino? First, I agree with Commissioner Gilmetti's comments and question. I would add to that in cases where you're analyzing urban areas like San Francisco, the amount of development activity going on there right now and how many roads that has impacted. I, I hope that would also be studied in terms of its at least temporary congestion impact as well as their underinvestment in building homes in San Francisco that also adds to uh, vehicle miles traveled for people getting in and out of the city. Are you weighing those factors as well, or are you only weighing the other factors that you mentioned when you do those studies? Yeah, so far the modeling did not take into account what I would call the land use effect. If you make vehicle travel less costly, especially in terms of, of time, you're not having to drive, Will people choose to live further away because of afford you know, the more affordable housing that's available, let's say, in the Central Valley? 
if you start to plug in those types of effects, my VMT numbers in that slide would go higher. Um, we haven't yet accounted for that particular effect. Any other comments? Well, thank you. I, I think for me the big takeaway is the bottom of this first slide, which says in 2040 you could look at 17,000 uh, VMT per capita or on the low end 82. That's quite a delta. So we could miss the mark by a lot if we don't really understand. So I think this is an area where uh, we need to figure out how to do sidebar workshops or get folks talking. Daryl was talking to us earlier about ridership being off and what they're doing, looking to really try to understand. You know, our business community looks at predictive analytics constantly, trying to forecast uh, what the changes are going to be. And for all of us with very precious transportation dollars, we've got to spend them well. Okay, item number 14, okay. Garth, okay. California Autonomous Vehicle. Yes. Uh, Commissioner's tab 14 is also an informational item, and, and Jean Shiramoto, who's the director of the California Department of uh, Motor Vehicles, is here to talk about their new autonomous vehicle regulations that uh, will be taking effect next month. That, Jean. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, hello, uh, Chair Emmett and the commissioners. So, uh, SB 1298 was passed in 2012 and signed by the governor. This legislation required the Department of Motor Vehicles to develop regulations allowing autonomous vehicles to be tested and operated on California public roads. Uh, in, September, in September 2014, our testing regulations, which required a driver in the driver's seat, became effective. Uh, as of today, we have 52 companies with active testing permits that can test on our public roads in California. We have 395 vehicles that are registered with us with the Thomas Vehicle Technology in it. And so far, we have 1,468 drivers enrolled as autonomous vehicle test drivers who are employees or contractors with the companies, and they are enrolled in our pull nose program where they have to have a, a good driving record. Uh, our so currently, we have uh, reported to us uh, 59 collisions uh, from these uh, companies that are testing in California, and any crashes are required to be reported to us within 10 working days. And of those 59 collisions, uh, GM Cruise has 28, uh, Waymo, who's formerly Google, has 25, Zoox has two, Nissan has one, Delphi Automotive has one, Uber has one, and Drive.ai has one. Uh, we are required also disengagement reports to be reported to us and the requirement that companies that had a permit uh, through 2017 uh, and reporting to us on, on January 1st of 2018, we received uh, 20 uh, disengagement reports from various companies uh, and we have that information. So then uh, for driverless testing, the Office of Administrative Law approved our, our regulations for driverless testing and deployment. Uh, they were approved by the Office of Administrative Law on February 26th, and they are effective on April 1st uh, of this month, uh, next month. So some key elements of testing without a driver in the driver's seat. Uh, these manufacturers that apply for us with us will have to provide written notification to local authorities describing the testing program, locations, where they're going to test, dates and times, and the vehicles. They have to provide uh, that to us. And also, they have to provide that information to the local authorities within which city that they're going to uh, be testing in. The, these uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles, will have to have a communication link between the vehicle and the remote operator and a description of how it's being monitored. Uh, there must be a way to display or communicate vehicle owner or, or operate information to a law enforcement officer if there's a need for the vehicle to be uh, stopped by law enforcement. Uh, the uh, Thomas vehicle must comply, uh, the manufacturer must comply with all federal motor vehicle safety standards, and if they don't, then they have to receive an exemption from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Uh, there must be a law enforcement interaction plan, and it must describe how the uh, remote operator will commute with law enforcement. Manufacturers must certify that a remote operators have completed training to safely execute their duties and they must possess the proper class of license for the vehicle being operated. Passengers that are not employees or contracts will be notified what personal information, if any, may be collected and how it will be used. We want to emphasize that privacy is very important. And again, crash reports have to be reported to the department within 10 days and annual disengagement reports must be uh, submitted to us annually. Uh, so that information, this is all posted on our website. 
So the key elements of the deployment is that the manufacturer identifies the operational design domain, which is the area they're going to be testing in, uh, where they're designed to operate and must certify uh, that information. Um, they must have a sensor that captures uh, data 30 seconds prior to a collision. That must have that. Uh, autonomous vehicle must also comply with all federal motor vehicle safety standards, or if not, have again, have an ex exemption for the National Highway Transportation uh, Association. Uh, the technology must be able, to, uh, must be designed to detect and respond to any roadway situations. The manufacturer shall identify where autonomous vehicles are incapable of operating. For example, if there's snow, fog, uh, black ice, or wet roads uh, conditions, they must identify where they cannot operate. And when necessary, updates to the autonomous technology must be made at least annually uh, and the effective date of those changes. And updates must be available uh, pertaining to location and mapping information where these autonomous vehicles are going to be uh, tested on. And the manufacturer that has uh, conducted test and validation methods and is satisfied their autonomous vehicles are safe for the deployment on California public roads. And there must be a consumer and user education plan. All this information is available on our websites. Um, one of the things I do want to uh, do, do touch about is, the, and it has been discussed, is the, the crash that occurred in Arizona, which is where the fatality with the pedestrian. And so we are aware of that crash. Uh, we are working to get more information on that. Uber has suspended uh, their operations in Arizona, California, Pennsylvania, and Toronto. And again, we have, and what we require in California is that any crash be reported to us within 10 days. Uh, so we're still working to get that information, and at this time, we don't have uh, much information to make any determinations based on what happened uh, in Arizona. So any questions regarding this? Any questions? I'm here now. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a statement, Chair, Madam Chair. We're going through the uh, Assembly Transportation Committee. Uh, we're going to hold a hearing on autonomous vehicles in May. And in light of the unfortunate incident in, uh, in Arizona, we'll be addressing that as we go forward, too, and, and looking forward. Uh, but I have to commend the, the DMV on, their, on the absolute must for public safety uh, going forward. They've done a really good job about addressing that. Unfortunately, there, are, there is a human factor still involved when you have aut autonomous vehicles, and that's the pedestrians or other people that are, you know, in, in the sphere of influence of the, of the vehicle. So, we're, But we will be holding a, a hearing, and uh, hopefully this will be a working document going, going forward. Any other comments? I do think also it just points out, and we don't know the details of Arizona, but early reports is pedestrian and perhaps not in a crosswalk. So I think for all of us uh, to remember to obey all the rules of the road, uh, whether we're propelling in a traditional uh, mode or not, I think uh, it'll help all of us with this new technology that's coming through. I have a question. Um, you talked about notification notifying the enforcement officers, but do we notify the public that we're doing these tests on their? Well, what we do require for uh, the driver that's testing and deployment is that the manufacturers must notify local authorities that they're going to be testing in their cities and locations. So they definitely, and then uh, through those local cities, they will be notification to the, to, uh, the uh, citizens of that area. So they actually do it to the citizens? Well, they would, well? through the uh, local authorities would do a notification. The manufacturers will inform uh, which the city location they're going to be testing in. We're going to be addressing that in the, in the hearing and how we can broaden that and, and make sure that the public is informed that it will be testing in the area. I have just one question. We talked about the new driver's license requirements. Yes. Um, what additional information are you all required that causes us to need a new uh, so this is uh, mandated by the, the federal government, so the Real ID Act. So uh, make an appointment. If you're going to come in, you have to get a new driver's license. If you want to get a federal compliant license, you're required to bring in a legal presence document. For example, that could be your birth certificate or a passport. And uh, so that's proof that we have, because we have to re-credential everybody. It's a requirement that everybody has to come into a, a DV field office, so we highly recommend an appointment. You have to also bring in a document that has your Social Security number, which could be your Social Security card, a W-2 pay, or a pay stub with your full Social Security number on it, and one residency document could be a utility bill. 
So our new license, I have a, a picture here. It's all this information is on our website. So in the upper right-hand corner, uh, which is required that the federal government requires a star, we have a bear with a star on it. And then uh, if you're going, if you do not get a, a federal required license, then you're going to get a non-compliant license that has uh, federal limits apply in the upper right-hand corner. But make an appointment. I highly recommend you make an appointment. Uh, we've issued probably since uh, we started issuing this on January 22nd, we've issued just a, under a couple hundred thousand, and we have about 28 million licensed drivers in California. Um, we expect a lot of people are going to wait till 2020. So um, I'd advise you to make an appointment and come on in. <laughs> but if you are between now and 2020, have a renewal, I would, I would wait to that, to that time. But we have to physically see everybody in person. Well, I think we don't want all 28 million in the same month for those appointments. <laughs> but if you still have a passport, you're good to board a plane or enter a federal facility. Okay, well, we'll try to help spread the word and get folks to trickle in, perhaps, and get it done <laughs> over the next 18 months or however long we have. So thank you very much, Jim. We appreciate you. you joining us. Okay, we're going to pick up our pace a little bit here. Item 15, state and local. Jacqueline. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. My legislative presentation for you, as you've noticed, has been updated from the original web posting. This is because some key bills were amended and we're committed to keeping you apprised of the latest information. To date, the Assembly has introduced 3,577 bills in the 2017-18 legislative session, and the Senate has introduced 1,725. Joe, Phil, and I are hard at work. Um, we do our best to read through them all as quickly as possible so that we can bring legislation of interest to your attention in a timely manner. Um, we also have an updated list of bills for you that we are tracking, as you'll see in one of the attachments to this book item. We've updated the format of this report to hopefully make it easier for you to visually track the progress of a bill through the legislative process and enhance the readability with a cleaner layout. So our legislative update for you includes staff recommendations on a few bills. We are recommending um, support of the following bills. AB 2418 by Assemblymember Mullen would establish the California Smart Cities Challenge Grant Program, which is consistent with our recommendation from the 2017 annual report. SB 1029 by Senator McGuire would require the North Coast Railroad Authority to transfer its assets and obligations as specified before April 2019. Senate Bill 1328 by Senator Bell would extend the operation of the Road Usage Charge Technical Advisory Committee until 2023. And finally, Senate Concurrent Resolution 90 by Senator Roth would designate a highway interchange in Riverside County uh, specifically where State Highway Routes 60 and 91 meet Interstate 215 as the Joseph Tavalione Interchange. This bill is an acknowledgement of Commissioner Tavalione's, in, Tavalione's sorry, leadership in transportation policy and his many contributions to his community and industry and the whole state of California. And Commissioner, your staff are very proud to work for you and it is our honor to recommend that the Commission supports this bill. We have just a couple more bills that we are not recommending a formal position on, but wanted to bring to your attention. Um, Assembly Bill 2548 by Assemblymember Friedman would authorize the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Agency uh, Transportation Authority, excuse me, in coordination with the South Coast Air Quality Management District to jointly adopt a commuter benefit ordinance. This is consistent with one of our recommendations in our annual report to the legislature. However, since it is a local issue and it's not a statewide issue, we are not recommending a formal position at this time. Um, and finally, AB 2734 by Assemblymember Frazier would exclude the California Transportation Commission from the Transportation Agency, establish it as a separate entity in state government, and require it to act in an independent oversight role. Okay. 
Um, just wanted to make a couple of comments on the Trump infrastructure pr uh, proposal. This is not in an official. This has not been introduced in an official bill yet. There's no legislative vehicle that I'm aware of, and it's unlikely that it will pass in its entire cohesive form that we've seen. It's also very vague and doesn't have a lot of details, but the um, proposal that is online does mention um, a couple of concerning issues that I wanted to highlight for you. First, the most common ratio of federal to state funding, which according to Caltrans is 80% federal to 20% state, um, sometimes up to about 88% federal to about 12% state. Um, it's a sliding scale. The Trump proposal basically flips this ratio on its head so that states would be required to come up with, at a minimum, 80% of the funding for a given project. Um, there is also a look-back provision for self-help states. And again, there really aren't specific details on this, but I just wanted to mention we're closely monitoring this in hopes that California will receive credit for the work that we've done in providing our own revenue. Um, are there any questions on any of these items? So it's an action. Okay, Commissioner Alvarado, go ahead. I, I'm glad that they changed it from the Joe Tavlioni Memorial interchange. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'd just like to ask one question, and, and, and I, sitting here, I, I, I pinched myself to make sure I was alive. It was <laughs> always been my understanding that you get an honor like this after you leave the earth. So I'm really concerned <laughs> Our, if, if you folks would really tell me that everything is okay. I, you know, I'm, There's a rose on your windshield. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm, 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 I'm glad I'm here because uh, pinching me uh, kind of scares me too. So uh, anyway. I would be honored to make a motion to adopt staff's recommendation. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Alvarado, a second by uh, Commissioner uh, Paul. And um, just one, I know, I was practicing it too. Paul V. Paul V. Paul v. We love you. Um, on the clarification, we're supporting in concept 1029, and I think we want to be clear with that because there are details yet to be worked out. So. Are you okay with that? Uh, yes, thank I think you that's for that how it's written, but I'm our, not sure that we said that. So. Our draft letter does specify that we're supporting in concept, and we've been in touch with the author's office, and they're very receptive to technical assistance. So okay. we'll be continuing the conversation. So, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining for the record? Motion carries. We will move on to item number 16, budget and allocation capacity. All right, and I would like to welcome Stephen Keck from Caltrans for the report on budget and allocation capacity. It's a long walk, usually I'm closer. Uh, Chair and Commissioners, normally I jump right into my presentation, kind of run up here and start on my first page. Um, but Norma's been my boss, my direct boss, for more than 12 years now. Um, and uh, she's been my friend and mentor for that time, and I can have a hard time saying this, but uh, I can't begin to describe how her retirement will affect me. Uh, but I can say this, I've never seen her as happy as I have these last few days. <laughs> <laughs> she's had Could such a smile on her face. Do with that? <laughs> it's, it's crazy, it's, it's such a huge smile, it, it, it warms my heart. So I, uh, I think it's very clear that I'll miss her very much. But um, She's not missing you. I just wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Uh, but I just wanted to, to, to say that before I begin my presentation, which I will begin with, um, my normal uh, allocation uh, status. So the commission has allocated about 60% of this year's allocation capacity through the last meeting in January. Um, that's uh, $2.4 billion out of $4 billion of capacity. And it's really right on track of where we should be. 
Uh, most notably, the shop has allocated about 84% of the allocation capacity f uh, through the year, and the STIP is at 58%. Now, the other programs, the much smaller ones, we've been adopting program guidelines and new programs throughout the year. You wouldn't expect them to be anywhere near that level yet. So uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about the, the lower allocation levels of those programs as we move into the end of the year. Uh, but we're really on a good track to allocate all the funds this year, or the vast majority of them. I was also asked to give an update on where we are with emergency funding and Commissioner Gometti, this goes to your earlier question about what we've been spending on these projects. Um, so the G11 gives the department authority to spend uh, to clear emergency projects and open the roadways back up to the public. Um, these can be from floods, fires, earthquakes, uh, other issues. And um, you know, there are some federal funds available for this, but this is a state responsibility. The feds make that very clear. Vince will probably shout it from the back. Thank you, Vince. Um, and, the, and the Federal Highway Administration has just $100 million in each year nationally to allocate out uh, just discretional funding to allocate out to states for disaster relief. The only time we see more disaster relief come is when there's something really big uh, that happens to many states, like a hurricane or flooding, where you might get a supplemental appropriation. We've got our fingers crossed. There was a lot of, uh, of damage last year. Um, we've got requests in and lists into our, 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 Congress, our congressional representatives of what California's needs are. Uh, we may see something or we may not uh, to bring more federal funding to California. But that leads to my last bullet on this slide, which is uh, since uh, the 1617 winter storms and all the way through today, or through, I should say, the end of last month, we have spent $668 million on emergency opening and uh, received about $14 million in reimbursement from the feds, which is about all we could expect from them given the, the funding that they have. So this is an impact to the shop. These are shop funds, um, uh, and we've taken that into account when we look at our allocation capacity. Um, but that's an uh, indirect answer to your question. And I believe District 5 expenditures have been uh, around 10% of that number, just a little less than 10% of that. The next good news item I have is to talk about the price-based excise tax. The price-based excise tax was put into place in 2010. It replaced the sales tax on gasoline. And the law that created the price-based excise tax requires the Board of Equalization to annually adjust that tax to maintain revenue neutrality with the sales tax that it replaced. Unfortunately, at the February meeting of the Board, uh, they failed to adopt a new proposed rate. The voting was 2-2, so they did not pass any uh, change to the rate, which means the price-based excise tax is <coughs> Uh, set to remain at 11 point cents per gallon for the fiscal year 2018-19. The uh, recommended rate from the Department of Finance and the Board of Equalization staff was 15.7 cents per gallon for a difference of uh, 4 cents a gallon. Now the 2018 fund estimate which sets the STIP and shop funding levels had assumed only 14 cents per gallon uh, tax rate for next year. And that was based on uh, estimates at the time and was consistent with uh, Department of Finance estimates as well. So the impact uh, to funding in terms of the difference between the fund estimate and the, uh, the rate of 11.7 cents uh, is just 157 million. And I say just for a reason. Uh, it's a huge number, but it, uh, it's a relatively small number of the entire funding for this step. The shop is also impacted at $43 million, but again, that's a very small percentage of the shop. Because the uh, difference between the fund estimate and the tax rate is, is $157 million out of a $3 billion capacity, $3 billion plus capacity in the STIP, I'm not recommending uh, any changes to the STIP uh, programming capacity at this time. Uh, and that's because next year, in two th I'm sorry, not next year, but in the 2019 uh, 20 fiscal year, Senate Bill 1 sets the uh, eliminates the price-based excise tax and replaces it with a 17.3 cent regular excise tax. So this uh, next slide kind of shows the impact in in perspective, and it kind of shows why I'm not recommending changes to allocation capacity at this at this late. I'm sorry, changes to programming capacity at this late date. The difference between the uh, assumed rate of 14 cents is the the blue line. 
and the red line, which is the Board of Equalization, now 11.7 cents for the 18-19 fiscal year, is just that orange box in there. So when you compare that to the total revenue, uh, I don't see a need to make drastic changes at this late date, given the STIP is up for adoption today. However, I, we will have to take this into account when we do the next fund estimate uh, in August of uh, 2019. Uh, finally, um, looking at what's coming up in the next few months, uh, Vince mentioned this already. Uh, there are some bills kind of working through Congress right now, but we don't know uh, what uh, or whether they're going to pass, but the continuing resolution does end on the 23rd. Um, in April, uh, Chart C, the famous Chart C, and the associated finance package will be released uh, to the public. I just saw the uh, latest draft, and it's more complicated than it has been for a while, uh, thanks to the addition of the, all the great new funding through Senate Bill 1. Um, in May, we can look forward to the, uh, the May revision of the governor's budget, and I'll bring before you the uh, final uh, advance, I'm sorry, um, ATV fund estimate at the next commission meeting. And in June, we expect to pass the next budget for the 18-19 fiscal year. Be happy to answer any questions. We have any questions for Stephen? Yes, Commissioner Dunn. Thank you, um, Stephen. Do, do you, with a two-two vote with the Board of Equalization, do they have the ability to re-vote that? And if so, do you think they might? So I'm no legal scholar, but right. I would say with an open vote like that, they could choose to re-vote it. I don't know whether they have plans to do so. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that that could happen, but mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's in the plans or not. Okay, thanks. Chair Frazier. So it's kind of disappointing when, the, uh, when you look at all this emergency funding that we need to take out of our shop, and then we have an agency that's playing political games with with we'll, a we'll swap when the legislature actually stripped them of their some of their duties. So it's kind of, in my impression, only my opinion, that it's kind of a payback. And it's unfortunate that, that this happened. I would hope that they take initiative and, as uh, Commissioner Dunn has stated, and go back and do the right thing. I always kind of wondered how a true up, to me, that's just kind of adding the columns up and settling up. So, um, you know, how it becomes a subjective vote is is, is a challenge. So uh, on the emergency number, I mean, I struggle with that number. It seems like we've had emergency after emergency. And this heading says from January of 17. And it, it seems to me that we've been talking about a billion dollars in emergencies last fall that we were up to. So are we comparing apples to apples? Apples and oranges, probably. So the billion-dollar number that's, that we've talked about is the estimate for total cost. That includes um, emergency opening and permanent restoration. And some of those expenditures can take years. This is the actual cash out the door that we've spent on these projects since that time. Have we paid all our bills? We absolutely pay all of our bills. Uh, commissioners, I would point out, <coughs> excuse me, on your info calendar, uh, under tab 37, page uh, 21, there's a detailed list of the uh, federal emergency projects and the identified cost that goes back to uh, 2010. Thank you. It just seems like Mother Nature has sent us one incident after another. So I'm surprised that number isn't even higher. So with that, thank you, Stephen, very much. And thank we you. too appreciate your acknowledgement of Norma and uh, we have noticed that she's smiling also so <laughs> item 17 Lori commissioners item 17 is an information item to present the draft 2019 active transportation program fund estimate and Stephen Keck will give a presentation on this item this one is a relatively short uh, presentation um, so the ATP fund estimate is developed specifically to set uh, program capacity for the active transportation program. Uh, it was developed in very close consultation with commission staff. Uh, the key points are that it assumes that the FAST Act funding will continue beyond the FAST Act funding horizon. That bill um, 
uh, ends, so this is the Federal FAST Act, that is, it ends in the 1920 fiscal year, so this assumes that that level of funding will still be available after that act, so the next act will continue this program. It assumes it will receive obligation authority at about 95% of the apportionment levels. That's a standard assumption that we also do with the STIP and SHOP fund estimates, where we try to estimate the amount of federal funding that will come in. And it includes a $4 million per year set aside for the California Conservation Corps, uh, as uh, specified in the Budget Act, for the first three years of the fund estimate. So the fund estimate itself, the results of which are displayed on the page two of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, we're looking at adding new funds into the ATP that were made available through SB1, and that was about $100 million a year. So when you look at the total revenues, total resources available for the active transportation program, it's about $223 million per year. $123 million of that was the traditional program and has already been programmed in the first two years of the fund estimate. And the new $100 million a year uh, it comes from SB1 that gives it to that higher level. So when we look at the resources available for programming, uh, commission staff has recommended a uh, $200 million set aside in the last two years of the program for future uh, programming. And the reason that is, is we're going from a program that was about $245 million, uh, or already programmed $245 million, up to now almost $900 million in new funding. So what this set aside does is it allows folks to prepare to program these projects. We will not moving the funding out. It will still be available in those two years, but it will be programmed as part of the 2021 ATP uh, process. So when we take all that into account, this fund estimate adds about $450 million in new resources to the ATP with 100 million being available in each of the first two years and 123 million available in the last two years of the fund estimate. Um, taking that into account, uh, you're looking at $450 million over the four year period. Uh, just 12 of it is reserved for uh, California Conservation Corps that I talked about before, and the rest is split uh, according to um, uh, legislation, according to the law. So that's a short description of the fund estimate. I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions on that? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Item 18, Road Repair and Accountability Act, SB1. Robert? Commissioners, tab 18 is an information item that provides an update of SB1 activities following the January commission meeting. Uh, since that meeting, staff received applications for the following competitive programs, lo local partnership program, trade corridor enhancement program, and Solutions for Congested Quarters program. In total, staff received 165 applications requesting $5.3 billion, uh, which is $2.7 billion greater than what we have um, available at $2.6 billion. Uh, staff recommendations will be posted on the Commission website on or before April 25th and will be presented for your consideration at the May Commission meeting. Uh, the following items will be presented to you today for your consideration. Adoption of the 2018 SHOP program, Adoption of the 2018 STIP, adoption of the Senate Bill Accountability and Transportation, or sorry, Senate Bill One, Accountability and Transportation Transparency. Let's try that again. Third time's a charm. Adoption of the SB One Accountability and Transparency Guidelines, adoption of the updated reporting guidelines for local streets and road funding program, and adoption of the 2018 Active Transportation Program Augmentation Guidelines, the California Conservation Corp. Uh, that concludes my SB One update. I'll be happy to address any questions you may have. With questions? Commissioner? Just want to once again thank staff for their diligent work on this. I know there's a lot of in here that you've completed, in, uh, and and uh, thank you for all your efforts. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Staff is um, it's been all hands on deck at the commission, as well as our partners have been helping out. Um, definitely could not have done it with the other program staff at CTC. Um, the long days of the program staff of our program as well as our partners. Commissioner Dunn. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And if there's anything that that seems to reinforce what we already know, the demand out there when you have between one and a half and three times um, based on the category uh, demand for the amount of funding available that we're we're uh, making available to the public. I mean, I think that needs to also be part of our story to demonstrate to the public um, 
how, how much SB1 is needed. So thank you for this information. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move on. Item 19, Adoption of SB1 Accountability and Transparency Guidelines. Dawn. Yes, um, good afternoon, Commissioners. So item 19 is an, is an action item for the adoption of the SB1 Accountability and Transparency Guidelines. Staff held two workshops to receive stakeholder input and presented the draft guidelines during the January 2018 Commission meeting. Key changes are shown in underline as presented in attachment A of your handout. Um, these proposed final guidelines are modeled after our Proposition 1B implementation plan. So you will see the re continued requirement of baseline agreements, progress reporting, and final delivery reports. The structure will allow the Commission to report on a project's scope, cost, schedule, and expected benefits in a timely manner and will inform our annual report to the legislature. In conclusion, staff would like to thank various stakeholders who participated in the guideline development process and look forward to implementing these guidelines to inform the public and legislature on the status and progress of our SB1 programs. With that, staff recommends the approval of these SB1 accountability and transparency guidelines, and I'd be happy to take any questions. We have a motion second. by Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Dunn, a question by uh, Commissioner Gometti. Um, thank you very much. These are very, very thoughtful. One, one thing that I thought uh, we might want to consider is what, what happens if they're not accountable? I, I, don't, I don't see anything in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good question. So um, we do have, keep in mind, so in our programmatic guidelines, we do have timely use of funds provisions in those, so that's one area. We also have included in these accountability guidelines the ability for Caltrans to withhold a percentage of a invoice if they don't um, submit a completion report. And then, of course, we also have um, the working relationship and the, um, the authority of the, OI, the new OIG, Office of Inspector General, to do audits on these, pro these um, projects. So those are the three areas that we have right now. Currently presented. M might we have something a little stronger? An audit, I, I understand an audit, but if it's still not, they're still not compliant with their application, mm -hmm. um, I'd like staff to think about that in the future and a modification of the guidelines. Okay, we can do that. As staff, we can um, go back to the table and um, put together some more, con some better consequences or stronger consequences and bring that back at a, a future date. Thank you. I'd like to echo what uh, Commissioner Galmetti uh, said. You know, I find I rarely find that there's true accountability without consequences, and so I'd like staff to come back with uh, some sanctions for failure to comply at a future date when these are uh, up for um, review. Okay. We have any other comments? We have a motion on the floor. Hearing no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Thank you, Don. Thank you. Motion carries. Motion carries. Madam Chair, could I just make a quick comment? Certainly. Um, you know, I just wanted to thank Don uh, Chester for all of her work on this and for all the partners. And there was a subset that actually worked along a subset of our partners that helped Don. But in particular, Don um, has been uh, handling the trade quarter enhancement program and a variety of other uh, work at the commission at the same time. Uh, putting together these guidelines, and I just wanted to recognize her. Thank you, Don, for all of your work. All right, we're going to move to item number 20, adoption of updated reporting guidelines for the road maintenance and rehabilitation account, local streets and roads. Uh, Commissioners, tab 20 is an action item uh, for the adoption of the updated local streets and road funding annual reporting guidelines. Updates proposed are technical in nature and include establishing yearly reoccurring schedule for the program, make administrative revisions throughout the document, and update the appendices to reflect an online tool that will be available to cities and counties to use in submitting their reporting and their projects. Draft guidelines were released to public comment on February 23rd. Two comment letters were received and are included in attachment C. As this is primarily a technical update, staff are not proposing any reporting changes to the guidelines at this time. The comments provided by the Advocacy Coalition and local government representatives have been noted. 
for future discussion. It will be part of our next update guidelines to the guidelines and online tool, which will take place this summer. After adoption of the guidelines today, the next step of the program will be statewide deployment of our online intake tool. Fiscal year 2018 and 19 projects list will be due May 1st. Commission staff appreciates the partnership and efforts of our stakeholders to help develop an efficient and reporting process and that promotes accountability and transparency. That concludes my presentation. Staff recommends the commission adopt the 2018 local streets and road funding annual reporting guidelines as presented in attachment A. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Paul B. And a second by Commissioner uh, Tavaloni. And a uh, question by Commissioner Dow. Yes, thank you. I, I'm prepared to support the motion, but I, I would, I, I just wanted to note that a county, for example, like Orange County with a major planning organization like the Orange County Transportation Authority and 34 cities, we're, we're just now trying to teach our cities how to do accountability on this stuff, how to comply with CTC rules and regs, et cetera. But um, it would be helpful, I think, in maybe another iteration if we figure out a way that the cities should send their project lists to OCTA so that there's coordinated planning between the regional agency and the cities that are doing this and not overlap. Um, it's not necessarily for screening purposes, but I know OCTA has gone out of their way, for example, to really try to help cities comply and get the information in to CTC. Um, and I think that coordination would make sense if we looked at that uh, in a more, maybe in a more formal way. And absolutely, and I know that um, at this point, you know, this is new, as you say, and um, we're working very closely with the uh, the league and CSAC and our partners. And so in our next iteration, uh, as we convene the next set of work group uh, meetings on this, that'll be front and center conversation to um, make sure that we're providing as much assistance as possible to make this process go smoothly. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Paul. Yeah, so um, I'm supportive of the of the uh, of the motion as well, but I just oh, just want to under section four, the program schedule uh, just just reemphasize got clarity from Laura Pennebaker on this issue that um, agencies understand that the project lists need to be at minimum include any work that is estimated to be completed in the upcoming fiscal year, and reflect multi-year uh, project schedule. Uh, so that it's it's clear because in my first reading of section four it wasn't clear but uh, Laura assur assures me that it's clear to the agency so we have one public comment on this Ronnie Berduca hi good afternoon uh, Ronnie Berduca here on behalf of the League of California Cities and also filling in for the California State Association of Counties. Uh, first of all, I want to just uh, thank the commissioners, the commission, um, uh, the executive director, and all CTC staff for working closely uh, with the league and CSAC in uh, developing the guidelines for the local streets and roads uh, reporting requirements. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, to work with uh, the CTC on developing those guidelines. I'm happy to report that all 58 counties and 479 cities uh, successfully submitted all um, their project lists uh, to the CTC for fiscal year 1718. Uh, we hope to have that same level of success for fiscal year 1819. Um, as you all know, uh, SB1 doubles the amount of funding for our local agencies receive in the long term uh, for road maintenance rehabilitation upon full implementation. Uh, so we're especially excited for, for next year where we see a full year's worth of funding uh, for our local streets and roads. Um, uh, again, thank you for working with us, and we look forward to uh, the continued collaboration. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Member uh, Frazier, as well. We have any further comments? Hearing none, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Moving on, item 21, Matthew, amendment to the 2018 Local Partnership Program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, item 21 is an action item to amend the 2018 Local Partnership Formulaic Program of Projects. 
This amendment is to add programming of $786,000 for the revenue vehicle replacement project as sponsored by two agencies, the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission and the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. The 2018 local partnership program, formulaic program, is funded from $100 million annually in state funds authorized by Senate Bill 1 that are allocated from the road maintenance and rehabilitation account to the local, local partnership program for fiscal years 2017, 18, and 2018, 19. The commission adopted the local partnership program guidelines during the October 2017 meeting and the 2018 local partnership program uh, share distribution was adopted by the commission on December 6, 2017 and contained share funding for 40 eligible agencies. On January 31st, 2018, the commission adopted $173.4 million in program funding for the initial program of projects, which contained 57 projects for 32 eligible agencies. This amendment to the program of projects will increase total programmed funds to $174.2 million in funding to a new total of 58 projects over fiscal year 17-18 and 2018-19. The remaining $25.8 million in formulaic shares is expected to be programmed by remaining eligible agencies by June 2019, which is the end of the current cycle. Staff recommendations are based on funding shares that were adopted in the formulaic uh, program share distribution, agency recommendations, statutory requirements, and commission policies as expressed in the local partnership program guidelines. Staff recommends your approval of this item as presented in the recommendation. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Gardino, a second by Commissioner uh, Paul V. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Moving on, item 22. Lori. Commissioners, item 22 is an action item to adopt the 2017 Active Transportation Program Augmentation Guidelines for the California Conservation Corps. The guidelines are included as an attachment to the book item. There's a minor change to the guidelines that's listed on the change list. Assembly Bill 97 directs 4 million of the 100 million the ATP receives annually from SB1 to the California Conservation Corps for active transportation projects to be developed and implemented by the California Conservation Corps and certified local community conservation corps. This begins in fiscal year 1718 and for the next 5 years. The California Conservation Corps Active Transportation Program projects must follow active transportation program requirements of being selected through a competitive process. Not less than 25% of the funds must benefit disadvantaged communities. And the California Conservation Corps must follow the reporting requirements expected of all active transportation program funds recipients and any reporting requirements established by the Senate Bill 1 Accountability and Transparency Guidelines. After undergoing a competitive evaluation process, the California Conservation Corps will submit its funding recommendations to the Caltrans Active Transportation Program Managers for review by April 9th, 2018. Caltrans Active Transportation Program Managers will review the project list and make a recommendation to, com to commission staff for approval. At the May 2018 commission meeting, staff will bring forward the list of projects recommended for funding to the commission for approval. After project list approval, the commission will allocate the funds to Caltrans as a lump sum also at the May commission meeting and Caltrans will sub allocate funding to the California Conservation Corps. I'd like to thank Bruce Saito and Julie Woolsey from the California Conservation Corps for working so cooperatively on these guidelines and also April Nitzos of Caltrans and Laura Pennebaker of Commission Staff for helping in the development of the guidelines. Staff recommends approval of the guidelines as in the book item. We have a motion by Commissioner Gometti, a second by Commissioner Paul. Any further discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining for the record? Item carries. Item 23, Lori. 
Okay, commissioners, tab 23 is an information item, and this is for staff to present the draft 2019 Active Transportation Program Guidelines. The draft guidelines are provided as an attachment to the book item. We are starting the fourth full cycle of the Active Transportation Program. Staff has held nine workshops beginning in October of last year with the ATP Stakeholder work group to develop these draft guidelines and has been consulting with the ATP Technical Advisory Committee. Staff is bringing forward the guidelines as an information item at this meeting to give the commissioners an opportunity to provide feedback before guideline adoption at the May Commission meeting. Staff is pro proposing two significant revisions to the program that are reflected in the draft guidelines. The first significant proposed revision breaks the application process down into five different applications based on project type and size instead of the one application that in, for all projects that we've had in the past cycles. The proposed application types are, are the following. So we would have one application for large projects that have a total project cost of seven million or greater. Medium-sized projects, they, those are ones with the total project cost between 1.5 million to 7 million. Small projects, small infrastructure projects, those are, are projects with the total project cost less than 1.5 million. Non-infrastructure projects and plans. These five applications will align application preparation level of effort with the project size. This allows applications to be streamlined for smaller projects while more information can still be requested for larger projects. The second significant revision to the program is that the 2019 Active Transportation Program will include a full four years of new programming capacity for fiscal years 1920, 2021, 21, 22, and 22, 23. In the past cycles, the ATP included two years of programming capacity. This change will allow project implementers to program their project phases over four years and increase project delivery success. This was covered in the draft fund est estimate presentation. Both of these significant program revisions have been supported by the working group. The, graph the draft guidelines have a couple of sections that now they state that they're under review and the most significant one of those is the project reporting section, and that's because staff is still working on that section in particular to make it consistent with the SB1 accountability and transparency guidelines. Along with input received during the workshop, staff has considered suggestions through phone calls, emails, and uh, there has been one formal comment letter. The comment letter is attached to the uh, book item. It is anticipated that the final guidelines will be presented to the Commission for consideration at the May 2018 meeting. This is an information item, but we would like to adopt the guidelines and at the May meeting. This concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions and take comments. It's an information item, Commissioner Paul? Um, so uh, I'd like to be able to quantify what the safe routes to school issue is in the state of California, how many outstanding um, projects uh, potentially they are. So I'd like staff to come back at some point and try to get their arms around the scope of the problem so that we can uh, measure ourselves whether, you know, how many years it's going to take us to solve that, that problem. Thank you. Okay, we have some public comments on this, if we could please. Jose Luis? Yes, you might have heard of a bee kill off that happened here in California. Thousands, millions of billions of bees all died. And the reason was, is that people weren't registering their beehives. And so California decided to imp implement consequences punishments to beekeepers who weren't registering their beehives. But upon future consideration, what was discovered is that the registration process for beehives is not at all easy. You have to mail it into an address that's not easy to find. I am all about true accountability uh, and, and consequences, but I also support what commissioners said about uh, providing as much assistance as possible. We're in the fifth or sixth round of ATP projects 
and we still don't have an online reporting tool. Uh, this is the first time regions have been presented with a list of agencies that are delinquent and reporting. Uh, the proposed ATP guidelines that are presented for information today, they propose two new consequences to sponsors who haven't reported on time. One would be withholding allocation of other projects that might belong to that agency. And the other one would be denying future applications from that agency. This list looks really long that's in tab 86. They will be probably looked at tomorrow. But just within the SACOG region alone, there's nine projects there. Four of those are agencies that turned in the reports, but we, they turned them in a month early. And so don't make it on this list. Regions haven't actually had a chance to use this list when we meet face to face with our agencies. Um, earlier it was said that uh, we should encourage partnership between regions and agencies. With SB1, we're kind of seeing the first time where local agencies are reporting directly to the CTC instead of that reporting channeling through regions. I meet with every city and county in the SACOG region at, at least every two months, and I'd be happy to go over these delinquent projects with them. Uh, and they would love that too before implementing punishments and penalties. So I just ask that this commission consider what we can do to partner, coordinate with regions, to uh, make these lists more transparent, and, and then, after that, consider implementing penalties. I don't know that penalties is the way to go about uh, getting the reporting. And those are my comments. We're really happy to work with staff, and staff has been uh, listening. I just think there's another way to get results before penalizing. Thank you. Thank you. Esther, California Walks. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Esther Postiglione with California Walks. Um, on behalf of California Walks, we want to voice our support for the guidelines that Ms. Waters has worked diligently to craft. We believe that these guidelines will help ensure the continued success of the ATP in funding projects throughout the state that help create a multimodal transportation network and address safety. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has designated seven cities across the state as focus cities due to disproportionate rates of pedestrian and bicycle injury and fatalities. ATP funds have been awarded and we believe are helping to address these rates in projects in cities like San Jose with the Coyote Creek Trail uh, connecting a BART station to the downtown, um, Fresno with the Midtown Trail, and in Santa Ana just down the way here with the First Street Pedestrian Improvements. Um, lastly, we want to voice um, our extreme appreciation for Lori Rodders, Waters, who has worked extremely hard and done a fantastic job of getting everyone at the table to work together. We support the guidelines she is presenting today, and we will look, look forward to the successful implementation of projects in Cycle 4. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Kenna? Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Kenneth Cow with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. I would like to join in the chorus of thanking uh, CTC staff Lori Waters and holding nine workshops. And it's not over. There's going to be hopefully one more. So um, we're looking forward to that. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, MTC will be providing our written comments uh, shortly. Um, and so they will be uh, given before the deadline in early April. Um, generally, they revolve around two items. One, um, reinstating a few points for small infrastructure leveraging of other funds and a little bit of discussion about Caltrans implemented projects. So we look forward to the next workshop and to the adoption of these guidelines in May. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. OK, we have one more. Jonathan? Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Matz. I am California Senior Policy Manager at the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. I just wanted to echo uh, the comments of my colleague, Esther, um, and express our, our sincere appreciation for uh, Lori Waters and, and uh, her work on these guidelines, which we're very optimistic about, and, and in, in particular um, for the expansion uh, into five application categories, which we're very optimistic is going to lead to uh, a much more diverse uh, range of proposed projects um, uh, than we've seen thus far uh, in an already compelling ATP cycle. Um, so we're extremely appreciative, um, and uh, thank you for uh, supporting uh, the active transportation program. Any further comments? Okay, that was an information item. My 
schedule says this would be a good time for a seventh inning stretch to keep with the sports theme. So we will take a quick 10-minute